What really matters, guys? You know, Jesus said a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. What does that mean? A man's life does not consist, is not made up, is not the sum total of the things he owns. What does that mean? Does that mean that I'm more than the way I dress, what I eat, where I live, what I drive, the kind of sound system that I enjoy? Is that what that means, Jesus? And Jesus would say, duh, yes, that's what it means. Because if you get caught up with material things, can a material thing satisfy a spiritual need? And the answer is no. But if your life is centered on the things that matter, then God's going to be the center of all things that matter. But if you're always pursuing things to satisfy, those things never will. I've known dads who say, I, I want to I buy a, you know, motorcycles for me and, and for my son so we can have quality time. No, you want to buy a motorcycle so you can ride your bike and your son can chase you as you go down the trails. Let's be honest. Because if you wanted to have quality time with your son, all you have to do is go into his room, sit down and say, hey, how you doing? What's up? Let's talk. That's what I do with mine. I don't have to buy him something so that I can spend time with him. I go into the room and I sit down and talk to him. What are you guys doing? How's it going? Do that with my daughters too. How's it going with your life? What's up with you? Because their life doesn't consist in the abundance of the things they, they possess. And it doesn't consist in the abundance of things I can buy for them to buy them off. It, it consists in fellowship. It consists in reality. It, con, it consists in friendship. It consists in, in the things that matter. And, and it, it all starts at the Word of God. And, and so this brother is saying here to us, the psalmist is saying, you know what? I love God's Word more than I love pure gold. Not just, not just gold. This is the refined gold that's been refined seven times. This is the pure gold. This is the absolute best. He says, I have come to love God's Word more than material things and material wealth. Why? Because my life doesn't consist in the abundance of the things that I possess. That's why. Because time with God. Because I might have all the money in, in the world capable of paying for the best medical bills, you know, best doctors to or pay for my medical bills. But if my baby is sick, I don't care how good that doctor is. I have to go to the one who can touch that baby. I have to go to the Lord. I have to have a relationship with him. And I pray that, 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 that the baby can get some great medical care. But what if there's no doctors available? Who do I go to? Who can I go to? I have to go to the one who can touch my baby without medical aid. I have to go to Jesus Christ. It begins there, you see. And so they were committed. They were committed to the word of God. And then third, in verse 42, they continued steadfastly in fellowship. When I was first saved, this concept of fellowship was absolutely new to me. I was one of those who was extremely self-sufficient. I didn't need people. But I was taught that in order for me to mature in the things of the Lord, I needed to have fellowship. I needed to have a relationship with other people if I was going to actually grow up. When I first got saved, we went to the small church. There was only one called Calvary Chapel at that time. And we went to Calvary Chapel there in Costa Mesa. And my friends and I, who were 19, 20, no older than 21, we'd all go to Bible study. Then we'd return to a friend's house and, and we'd all be there together. And, and we'd continue what we had begun that night in the Word of God. And someone would open the Bible and we'd continue reading. And, and they'd share something that the Lord had laid on their heart. And, and then we would all be there sitting in a circle on the carpet. And all that's what hippies did. And, and, and there'd be a time of prayer and, and worship and we'd sing. We would sing songs and we weren't trying to impress the person next to us. We just sang our hearts to the Lord and that's what we did. For me, it was a brand new thing, to be honest with you. I wasn't used to that. I wasn't used to men hugging other men. I grew up in, a, in an environment that just doesn't take place. You know, my dad might ruffle my hair or, 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 you know, hit me on the rear end when I walked by when I was a little kid. Hey, how you doing? That was about it. I mean, my dad wasn't a huggy kind of guy, and kissing your face kind of guy and I I love you kind of guy. I grew up in the typical home that most of my friends came up with, with a dad who worked hard, put food on the table, but he wasn't really an openly affectionate man. So when I got saved and I got men walking up, hugging me, I love you, brother. I mean, I said, what are you doing? I did not like that. I did not like that. I said, come on, you know, and I would kind of stiffen up like, what's this is all about? Come on, man, you know, we can be friends at a distance. You don't have to do that. I can remember when we would sit down and when we, the first time, it went on for a few times, actually. The first time we sat in that little circle there and they said, let's pray. So I was, I always prayed by clasping my hands in front of me. That's how I was taught to pray. But they didn't do that. They wanted to hold hands. Now, I didn't have a problem if there's a girl next to me. Yeah, hold your hand. But when it was a guy... 
I was very uncomfortable holding men's hands. So I would squeeze them really hard like, man, you know, you don't get any ideas about me. I'll break your fingers. I did not. I'm serious. I'm not kidding. I'm serious. I did not like that. I, I, I had a friend named George who, who brought me to the Lord who would who would hug me and, and, and I love you, brother. And, and, and I, I, you know, and that's that. That's nice, you know. So I didn't understand that until I began to see that as being, well, that's what families are supposed to do, isn't it? Isn't it? That's what families are supposed to do. Love one another, right? I mean, when you read the New Testament, I would encourage you to do this. If you have a concordance, look up the words one another. And you're going to see that you will find those two words together throughout the New Testament. One another, one another. So many instances because God wants us to know that we need each other. That's the reason why we have issues of life. That's why we have moments with the master. That's why we have retreats and conferences, small groups and breakfasts and, and a variety of things that we have here so that we can get to know one another as a family. And Jesus in John 13:34 said, A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 10 said, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, honor one another above yourselves. Paul in Romans 15, 7 said, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you. In Galatians 5, 13, he wrote, serve one another. Ephesians 4, 2, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Ephesians 4, 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgive one another, just as in Christ God forgave you. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good works. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching, amazingly, they actually enjoyed each other's company. The body of Christ actually understood that they needed each other. And I hope that we in this church will grow to understand that too. I need you guys. I do. I, I, I need you. I, I need your friendship. I need your love. I need your prayers. I need you. I do. I have no shame in admitting that. Before I got saved, I'd have said, who needs you? Now that I'm saved, I say, I need you. Why? Because without you, I'm not complete. The body of Christ is made of many members, but it's the one body. I can only do that which I'm gifted to do. And without your help and, and your love and your friendship and, and your gifts, this church will cease to be a church. And I don't want that. I fear that. I fear that. I fear that we can become a group of strangers. We already are to some degree. But I fear that. I want our fellowship to be modeled after what Jesus Christ intends the church to be. He said, I will build my church. And what I'm asking you to be is part of his church. To admit your love for him and for one another. Make sure you're right with God. Hunger for his word. Love one another and let's see what God can do in our lives. Let's see what the Lord will do in us if we actually take these words seriously. You have opportunities to go to Bible studies. Don't be the kind of person who thinks that I can go once in a while. I don't really need the word of God that much. Be somebody who hungers and thirsts after God. Hunger and thirst for his word. Hunger and thirst for teaching. Hunger and thirst for fellowship. And watch what God will do in your life as you pursue him. He will transform you radically. And you'll become that image so that when he looks at you, he will see himself. The way when I look at my babies, I say, I can see some of me in you. I can see some of me in you. My influence, my characteristics, you're my baby I see myself in you. Well, how about asking the Lord to look at you and say, Lord, can you see yourself in me? And if you can't, remove whatever it is so that you can.